my glasses. Um, I hope that's not too much of a problem, right? Okay. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to find some other way for me to do this. <laughs> um, let's move ahead with our Bible study. We started it last week. And if you remember, uh, and especially for those who may be joining, who it was not there last time, we are going through this um, book uh, published by our church, uh, and it is titled, We Believe. This is available on our website, and you can download the entire book. It is the, if you, if you need the link, uh, Praveen can send it to you. Uh, but that is what we are following so that we are more structured in our Bible study. So the, the title of this book is We Believe. Now, just to recap from last time, we are Christians. We are disciples of Jesus because of our belief system. And what we are doing now is we are trying to get into the depth of our belief system. We are trying to understand our belief system. So in one sense, we are doing theology. And uh, like uh, uh, Gary Darrow says, he says, theology is faith seeking understanding. So in other words, we have faith because of the belief we have, but we want to understand that faith, you know, with greater clarity. And that's one of the reasons why um, we do these kinds of studies. So we will refer to scriptures. We will, of course, look into the word uh, and uh, bring a summarization of various scriptures and then spell out our belief. We will look, you know, look at various verses to synthesize them and understand what it is telling us. And of course, uh, like you may have heard, we contextualize, in other words, how does this uh, these scriptures apply to us today. So these are some of those uh, disciplines that we will continue to uh, visit as we do these studies. Now, uh, just wanted to mention something uh, before we carry on from where we left off last time. The first one is, I will be leaving out some questions. Now there are several questions in in the first in the in each section and sometimes i may leave out one or two because uh, they may be more repetitive uh, they may not uh, they, they may have been addressed somewhere else but if you should have any questions or any of those sections left out or any of those points left out uh, feel free to you know bring them uh, you know to my attention and and we can always uh, discuss that uh, we will like we did last time, we will go for about 20-25 um, minutes and uh, Praveen, if you can keep time and just let me know when we can stop. And then we will sit down and, uh, you know, take some questions that you might have. Uh, sometimes the questions, you know, may need more exploration. And so I may tell you that I'll come back to you. And I think I did, um, um, you know, come back to a couple of you with the questions that you asked, and I hope they have been clarifying. And so, uh, so sometimes we may not be able to answer a question uh, because it needs a little bit more study. And we, uh, but I will always come back to you on that. Okay. Um, if you notice, our section one is dealing with the triune God, and I want to mention something before we start looking into the uh, text of this book. Uh, we deliberately start with the triune God because as you know from our discussions in the past and you know the many sermons that you have heard in our fellowship, one of the questions, one of the most crucial questions we constantly ask is, who is God? And so this section deals with you know, more and more trying to understand who is the God that we worship. You know, Jesus himself asked that question uh, early in his ministry as he was beginning his 
ministry with, you know, along with the disciples. If you remember, uh, he asked the question, who do people say I am? So the question who I feel is, um, and we believe in our fellowship is a very important question to ask. If you go back into the Old Testament, how many times you read how God constantly brings out this particular phrase. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so that kind of identification is very much a part of the scriptures. And so who is this God is something that uh, we constantly ask. Now the question is, why should we ask such a question? Um, why is it necessary for us to know who God is? And this is uh, something important, you know, to answer that. You know, when a person gets married, just to use uh, an analogy here, what's the first question that person must ask? Does the person ask, well, um, I need to find a venue for the marriage. I need to find a, uh, a celebrant for the marriage. I need to find... How many people to feed? How many people to invite? Is, are those the first questions that, that, that normally come to mind when, when a person is, wants to get married? I think you know the answer. The, per, the first question the person must ask is, who am I getting married to, right? So the who is such an important question, you know, in a relationship, because you are now entering a relationship when you talk about marriage. But any kind of relationship, the question who is a very important one. And that is the most vital question we ask even in our relationship with God. Because our interaction with God is a relationship. And so uh, the need for us to ask the question, God, who is the God we worship? Who is this God that I am going to be having a relationship for all eternity? And we believe in our fellowship that all of theology, all the doctrinal statements, the doctrinal constructs, uh, our entire belief system must be based on this uh, question. Who? Unless we are, know who God is, our doctrinal positions can sometimes become faulty. Right? In other words, what I'm saying is the question who um, is necessary because through that we evaluate all that we believe. Uh, it's like a lens. It's like, you know, the glasses that you wear. When you see through those glasses, everything, uh, you know, has a particular focus. And so it colors everything you see. And so that's the reason why we ask that question. It's your worldview, we you would say. For example, if you only believe that God is your master, you will feel like a slave. Now, I'm not, it's not wrong to, you know, regard God as your master. But if that is your only uh, worldview of the God you worship, then you will feel like a slave. But on the other hand, if you believe God to be your father, how will you feel? you will feel like a son or a daughter, don't you? you know? Or if you believe that God is only a lawgiver, you end up in a relationship with laws. Those laws become more important than the person of God, which happened with the Pharisees. If you remember, the Pharisees were more interested in the law than with the person who gave the law, right? So we descend into moralism or moral, moral, you know, uh, uh, way of life becomes more important rather than the person that we should be having a relationship with. Or if, uh, you know, if you think of God as only one to be obeyed, if that is what is uppermost in your mind with regards to God, the God we worship, then our religion becomes only a way of life. You know, we have many times talked about Christianity being a way of life. But sometimes that can 
become very inward looking. It can have a selfish focus if you are only looking at God from the point of obedience. Uh, that will be completely divorced from a relationship. And so I'm bel belaboring the point here because uh, as we go through the section, we are constantly uh, asking that question, who is this God? Who is this God? You know, many people only have half the story uh, with regards to who God is, and they get completely confused. Um, you remember, you know, uh, in our culture, we use, a, we use a particular example with regards to, to know who God is. You remember the elephant story and the four blind people? Four blind people one day wanted to know, uh, or rather they, they came to an elephant and they tried to touch the elephant of its different parts. And so one person touched the leg, one person touched the trunk, one person touched the ear. And how did they explain the elephant? One said, oh, it, it's like a tree trunk. One said it's something else. One said it's, you know, yet another one. But you never get a picture of God, the full picture of God in that way. And that is what sometimes we are like. We sometimes have just part of the story. But the only person, I mean to say, the only way we can know God is the one who's seen God. And who has seen God? Who has been with God? And that is, of course, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay. So I, I, I say these a few things because we are going through this section and asking the question, who is God? And uh, I feel it's important that we keep in mind uh, who God is so that um, our theology, our belief system will be based on a solid foundation. Otherwise, um, we can begin to, um, you know, veer away from uh, the person of who God is and many a times lead into all kinds of uh, heresies. Okay, having said that, uh, let's go to the book. And I'm going to pick up from point 1.5. I think we stopped at 1.4 last time. And so we'll go to point 1.5. Uh, the question asked in 1.5 uh, 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 is, are there, are the three persons of the Trinity, three different ways God acts towards his creation or three roles the one God plays? And the answer to that is no. In the being of God, there is the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit who uh, know, love and glorify each other for all eternity. There never was a time when God was not triune. Uh, just to make uh, a few comments there. And uh, this also, I think, um, answers a question. I, I think it was Shanti who asked that question with regards to uh, the triune nature of God. And could it be that this one God is uh, takes different roles at different times? And that is not true. Uh, we have one being, but three persons or three persons. You know, three ways God reveals himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It is not one person who is playing the three roles of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, like I mentioned last time, that goes into a heresy that uh, was uh, being circulated even early in the in church history called Sabellianism uh, or modalism. And which basically means one person acting in three different ways. Uh, that's not true. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three distinct persons or hypostases, like I mentioned last time, the Greek word, and that is supposedly much more accurate. Today, if you, um, uh, if there is one, uh, there, is, there is one movement called the oneness movement. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. But there is a uh, branch of 
the Christian, you know, uh, the religion called the Oneness Movement, where they believe Pentecostalism. Uh, oneness Pentecostalism is that how it is? Uh, yeah. yeah. They believe that God is only one, singular, and they deny the whole Trinitarian concept that is preached in the scriptures. And they believe this one God was the father at one time, then he became the son in his incarnation, and the same one God then became the Holy Spirit. And so uh, that is what they believe. But we reject that because that is not what the scripture says. Okay, let me move to 1.6 now. Question in the booklet. Is one of the persons of the Trinity the origin of, uh, of the others and thus superior? And the answer there again is no. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equally eternal and divine and share the same authority and power and have the same mind, will, and purpose in all things. Uh, I think it's uh, very important for us to understand that God cannot have an origin. So one did not originate another. So none of them, like uh, some erroneous teachings, that they believe the sun was created or the first creation of God. Now, that is not what the scriptures tell us. They are God. Okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is God. And God has no origin. He was always, he was eternal. Right? Equal, and they are equally eternal. Now, you may have a question, uh, you know, there with regards to hierarchy. Is there a hierarchy in the, in the Trinity? Is the Father the, the lead person? You know, um, I'll tell you what. There are also other questions that can come out of that. For example, you may also wonder, you know, what, how, how does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the, and the Son? Uh, what is this procession? Or you may also wonder, how is that the Son is begotten? Now, these needs, th these uh, questions need much, much more uh, focus. So we won't answer those now. We will come to that at another time. Okay, but suffice it to say that God is eternal, which means to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternal. There was no beginning to any one of them. They all are eternal and they're all God. Moving to 1.7. Does the equality of the three divine persons mean that they are interchangeable with each other? The answer to that is no. The divine persons are not interchangeable parts of God. Each has a unique relationship of holy <laughs> love and each has an eternal name that reveals their real personal distinction. So what you have to keep in mind there is that uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are not parts. In other words, they have no separation. Uh, they are not uh, separated beings suspended in space. Uh, you know, once again, they are one being. Uh, uh, so... And what is also important to understand is one does not become the other. Okay, so um, that's what it means, interchangeable. In other words, one becoming the other. No, that is not what it says. Once again, uh, these are all very deep mysteries. Um, you know, they are. They, they, this belongs to a different dimension. We are just using words to be able to understand or try to explain, but obviously, uh, the um, uh, the reality is much much beyond our comprehension. But suffice it to say, they are not different parts or separated from each other. They are one God, but yet Father, Son, Holy Spirit are distinct. Point one one point eight. What are the unique relationships in the being of the Triune God that are not interchangeable? And the answer is, the Father eternally begets the Son. The Son is eternally begotten by the Father. And the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and through the Son. This is what I was telling you just a while ago. 
that there is this word called procession and then there is begotten uh, these are these are mentioned in the scriptures they are theological language in one sense and what i will i i will not get into those because that becomes a huge study by itself we will explore them a little later and we will discuss what is the meaning of begotten and what's the meaning of procession so i'll move to point 1 1.9 do the three divine persons act independently of each other towards creation and the answer is no all the works of the triune god toward his creation are indivisible since god is one in being and of one mind will authority and holy love this i think is an important point many a times people will uh, wonder uh, and have a question if god has three distinct uh, three wills and that is not what the scriptures indicate uh, the oneness of god is never under question right um, uh, the father the son and the holy spirit are distinct but they have one will one mind one love uh, one the father's love is not greater than the son's love or the the son's love is not greater than the holy spirit's love you know they all have one love and one will and so their their interaction with the universe or with the creation is all united in union uh they have one love towards us and it's interesting if you read in the book of john the father loves the loves us in the same way he loves the sons in other words there is no split in any of uh, their dealings with each other and of course with the creation we'll move to 1.10 is there no difference then in how the three divine persons relate to creation there is a difference for though the acts of the divine persons are undivided each contributes uniquely to the perfectly united works of the one triune god once again uh, these words can be just sometimes a little bit confusing um they may have different roles right for example the son you know uh became flesh the father didn't become flesh the holy spirit didn't become flesh but the son did so in other words that role was unique to the son but that does not mean to say that the father has no role in the son being or becoming a uh, uh, you know uh, the flesh they are united in all that they do with the creation okay so i'll just leave that there uh suffice once again you know this is enough to say that everything that the father son holy spirit does with creation are united there is no squabbling there is no difference of opinion uh the father never disagrees with the son the son never disagrees with the father and that is what is important for us to understand okay, okay let's move to i'm going to skip from 1.11 to 1.12 now uh 1.11 once again like i said can be uh you know you can read that on your own 1.12 says what are the primary acts of the triune god towards creation and it says the father is most associated with creation the son with redemption and the holy spirit with bringing all things to perfection however all three of the divine persons are involved in all the works of the one triune god once again you have language there that can be a little confusing but once uh, it is basically trying to show how each one is distinct in their roles and yet they are all united in uh, their actions and their expressions of love for example like it says um the father is mostly associated with creation for example in john the book of uh, the gospel of john chapter 1 and verse 
I'll read it for you. It says, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Notice, through him. Who is the him? Jesus Christ. So it is through him. The father, through Jesus Christ, is, you know, brought everything into existence. So the father's role in creation, but the son is not left out. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In him, him is once again Jesus. We have redemption. So Jesus is a uh, unique role, is re the redemption. But once again, the, the grace of God is very much part of that redemptive process. Let me read you one more scripture and I'll bring in the Holy Spirit here. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, where it says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In other words, now the Holy Spirit's unique role is to bring the love of God into our hearts so that we can begin to uh, manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us you know, produces the fruit that we as human beings need to uh, ultimately uh, uh, manifest. So you see how um, the Father's role in the creation, the Son's role in redemption, and the Holy Spirit's role in the perfection or the, you know, the bringing forth the fruit. You begin to see the distinctions there, and yet you begin to see also how they're all united and they're all, you know, working with each other to to bring about those, uh, uh, each one of those perspectives. Okay, we'll move to 1.13, where it says, why did the triune God create? And the answer is because the triune God is a living, loving, and generative God who creates for the sake of communion and holy love with his creation. What I'd like you to uh, notice there is creation is an act of love. In other words, it's an overflowing of the love of God that brings creation into existence. In one way, you could say God is sharing his love with the creation. What we have to understand is uh, creation is not that God could have some slaves or some servants to do his work. Creation is not so that God could take the pleasure of punishing somebody. right? Or, for that matter, creation is not for the sake of loving somebody. Because God was love even before the creation. You see, because God is complete in himself. So God, God did not create only so that he could love somebody. Or... Creation is not so that God could have someone worship him as though God craves worship. So then God is a very selfish God. So the act of creation is an act of love. It is the overflowing of God's love which can be shared with his creation. So just leave you with those thoughts. I know they are uh, very deep, but then, uh, you know, we can... Uh, uh, you know, think about that.